tryptophan is simply uh, a similar compound where the benzene ring is replaced by the indole ring. Now I mentioned also pyrrole, and one of the fascinating, at least I find fascinating things about uh, molecules is that if you try and look at the alternative pyrrole amino acid, this compound, very simple compound, not many atoms in this molecule, but it's effectively unknown. And it's very unstable at room temperature. And there's nothing in the literature about the chemistry of this system other than that it can't really be made. Tryptophan is important, uh, just a bit of general background here, because it can be converted in the body to hydroxytryptophan. You just put a hydroxyl group on, the enzymes do that, and then the uh, CO2 can be taken out of here to give you 5-hydroxytryptamine, which is serotonin, which is one of the reasons why you are still awake, I think, this morning. This is what keeps you awake. But then further conversion to put this acetyl group on the amino group uh, gives you n acetyl serotonin. And methylation here gives you melatonin. And melatonin is what puts you to sleep, hopefully only at night. The indole nucleus turns up in many, many very important natural products, biologically active natural products, uh, structures of structures of this kind, where here is the indole ring, indole ring here, uh, features in all of these things, some anti-tumor compounds, naturally occurring. Uh, anti-fertility compounds, this has two indole rings and another compound here similarly. And I'll just quickly show you some more of these. LSD, famous psychomimetic drug, is based on that kind of indole ring. And most of these compounds, you can see, come from tryptophan because you have attached here carbon, carbon, and then there's the crucial nitrogen atom. So again, some more of these uh, highly potent biologically active compounds. And two of the uh, most famous ones here, uh, recipine, an old one, again with that uh, indole structure, you know, hempine. And these two anti-leukemia compounds, drugs still used in the treatment of leukemia, in blasting. There's two of them. These are doubled up structures and two more there as well. The indoles can be compared with phenols. Phenols, famous compound here. And if you have a substituent in the opposite position to the hydroxyl group, the para position, these phenols are highly reactive at the adjacent position. Pyrrol similarly is reactive at these adjacent carbon positions. And indole itself is most reactive at this one, two, three position. If you substitute three position, then you find that the reactivity is most powerful at C2. And the basis of the work I'm going to talk about this morning is that we decided some years ago to put methoxy groups in these two positions on the benzene ring. And these have the, the capacity to activate C7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So that's C7 and also C2. And so we have a structure that is similar to the phenolic structure where there are two nucleophilic sites but the, uh, the situation is quite different. The symmetry is different, as we will see. The phenols are famous for their formation of polymers, phenol formaldehyde polymers. 
of Bakelite, in fact, was the first uh, real polymer at the beginning of the last century. And as well as getting lots of polymers, uh, if you react these phenols with formaldehyde, you get compounds that are called calixarenes, which Professor Charles is one of the world authorities on calixarene chemistry. And these have beautiful structures. They form a cone-shaped structure uh, or a calyx shape, and that gives the rise to the name of calixarenes. So what happens if you replace the phenols with indole? Well, first of all, pyrrole. If you do this chemistry with pyrrole and react with carbonyl compounds, the first thing you get are compounds that are similar that we call calyx pyrroles. But if the reaction is with an aldehyde, then you have a hydrogen at each of these positions, and the calyx pyrroles are unstable rapidly are oxidized to the porphyrins. Now, the porphyrins are some of the most important natural products. Uh, the porphyrin system is at the core of hemoglobin, chlorophyll, uh, and a slightly modified version in vitamin B12. The porphyrins are extremely stable and they have an aromatic protein pie system which gives rise to these flat, stable uh, compounds. If you do this chemistry with a ketone, and these positions are all substituted, then the reaction stops here. And so we have a link between the calixarene type structures where the heterocyclic nucleus, whether it's uh, or pyrrole or indeed indole or benzene, joined by carbon atoms, CH2 or C substituted atoms. And that is a link to the situation where the heterocyclic rings are more rigidly uh, directed together. And we'll see that as one of the themes that we'll develop during the talk. And so if we take our indoles, three substituted 4 6 dimethoxy indoles which react at C2 and C7. These react well with aromatic aldehydes and you can link together three of these joined by a single carbon atom. Now because there is uh, not the same degree of symmetry in these as you have in phenols, there are two possible structures that can be built uh, from these systems. One has the three links to the same, from the two C2 to C7, C2 to C7, C2 to C7. And the other has three different links, C2 to C2, C7 to C2, and C7 to C7. And depending on the actual nature of the compounds, the reactivity of the contributing uh, elements, you can form either one of these usually quite selectively. The structures, although you can look at these and design them, uh, this one in particular could be a cone structure, but this is the uh, 2 to 7, 2 to 7, 2 to 7 link system, and it's not a cone structure at all. It's a, what we call a flattened partial cone, uh, which simply gives more space for these uh, groups to, uh, to have. That's the other one we have is the, you see the 2-2, two, two, the 7-2 seven, and 7-7 seven, seven link system. It's also quite a, an ugly, uh, complicated structure. Uh, it has one indole with then the 2-2 two, two link indole system uh, slightly at right angles to that, like a cliff. But they're not beautiful structures. And one of the aims in, in designing and doing this chemistry was to try and achieve some beautiful structures that might be able to play a part as the calixarenes have played and as the porphyrins have played in attracting small organic molecules, selectively uh, attracting them for separation purposes. 
If you take our three substituted 4,6-dimethoxyindoles, you can formulate and just put a formal group at C7, major product, C2 is a minor product, or you can put one at each of C2 and C7. And all of these aldehydes can be easily reduced to hydroxymethyl compounds. These are effectively uh, reactive versions of benzoic alcohols. And so we'll see that they participate in chemistry, standard benzoic alcohol chemistry uh, through the benzyl cation. And so if you take the, one of these alcohols, these are in a sense the intermediate structure in the reaction between the indols and the aldehydes that we saw initially. And so you can have the seven hydroxymethyl or the two hydroxymethyl. And these not only give the calyx three indol, but also generate calyx four indols, where four of these are joined together by four single carbon units. And this has the same linkage arrangement, two to seven in four cases. In putting four indoles together with four single carbon units, there are four ways of doing this, and we'll see at least another one of those in a moment. Interestingly, the chemistry from the seven methanol uh, gives both of these, but if you start with the two methanol, you only get the calyx three system. And this is a function of the different reactivity that you have with the benzoic cation and with the nucleophilic site on the indole. I mentioned that you can design a beautifully cone-shaped structure for the calyx 3 system. It's not the most stable one. And so what we had to do in order to generate a cone formation was to take the hydroxymethyl structure and build onto it an amide to give the capacity for some hydrogen bonding. Now still the major product is the flat and partial cone, but you do now uh, isolate, you can isolate some of the cone structure from this. And it's held together in the cone shape by hydrogen bonding from these amides. Again, it doesn't happen if you start with the seven substituted, but only the two substituted will give that. And the crystal structure, it's uh, perhaps difficult to see, but it is a cone-shaped structure. Here are the amide groups dangling on the same side of the cone and undergoing hydrogen bonding, bonding uh, that's uh, between these groups. Interestingly, uh, this crystal structure has a molecule of ethanol, crystallized from ethanol, has a molecule of ethanol in the cup. Not a good thing for a Muslim country. In the case of the calyx 4 indole, although the ring size is bigger, you might imagine there is a bigger cavity and a bigger hole in which to attract small molecules. This closes in on itself to form a cubic structure, only four angstroms across. And so there's really not enough room in this hole to put anything. Perhaps you could put a hydrogen or helium gas uh, element in there, but it's essentially very, very tightly closed up. Now, one of the themes that will emerge from this is to use the chemistry that we've found. We've got uh, chemistry now established where you, from the indoles, you can functionalize, you can have aldehyde groups around the indole. They can easily be reduced to hydroxymethyl compounds. And the benzoic acid chemistry can be carried out again. And so here is a, a diendylyl methane with the a benzoic alcohol system, which are able to be reacted with nucleophilic activated indoles. Now here, in this case, we are using uh, the 
Bono substituted aldehyde simply to block one of the two reactant positions. And now this leaves the C2 as the only effective uh, reacting site. And so this will react with each of the benzylic alcohols to build up a tetrakindalyl system. And now we have two aldehydes. These can be reduced to the alcohols and the acidic catalysis will close that off in another reaction that we have discovered is very, very common. And it's a reaction where one of the benzene rings, or the indole benzene rings, uh, reacts with the other carbon. And there's an ejection and extrusion of formaldehyde to give this structure. So this is a different kind of uh, calyx 4 system has a 2 2 link, 7 2 7 7, and 2 7. And that also has a rather ugly shape. It closes in on itself and gives just a small uh, gap in the structure. So, although we're making bigger rings, we're not making bigger holes and bigger cavities. And that's another theme that will emerge. What we find, and I'll mention it now because I might forget at the end, what we find is that in designing and, and building structures, it's often very important to combine rigid systems with flexible systems. That, that's something that we've learned as the work has gone on. Now, we come to uh, the rigid system. Here is the porphyrin ring that we saw before. Adic high aromaticity, highly stable uh, structure. And we wondered some years ago whether we could make uh, a molecule like this, which we call the endorphin, which has four indole rings. And so, in effect, we're fusing in benzene rings here, 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 and here. But it's not quite so simple as that because. In this structure, we cannot achieve the 18 pi aromaticity unless we destroy the aromaticity of the indole rings. And we've learned over the years that the indole aromaticity is more important. It's a more stabilizing influence. So we thought we should like to make this structure. It's a very beautiful structure. It's very symmetrical. And it should be, in a way, similar to the porphyrins, but in another way, a more important way, more different. It will have different properties because it lacks this 18 pi aromatic system. And so, many years ago, we thought we would be able to do this, and we developed chemistry where we were able to take an end alone and combine it to make the C2C7 direct link. Now this is the crucial link, and it's a link directly between the two indole rings, unlike the systems that we've seen earlier, where there was a carbon in between. And although we were able to make some compounds that had this C2C7 link, I won't go into the detail, but the uh, we got lots of mixtures, lots of different compounds, things that we were not looking for. And even though we were able to make some of these, we never quite were able to get the right substitution pattern to enable that to go on. Again, just to show you, uh, the reaction is okay, but here, one of the best reactions that put three of these together has two phenyl groups here and of course we have to have a vacant group here in order to keep building the system. And so we couldn't actually do what we were trying to do. And we more or less uh, thought in principle it should be possible simply to take four of the aluminium chloride systems that you could get from the endolone and put four of these together. But it's not as simple as that, and it doesn't happen. We've got lots of mixtures, and this very beautiful structure, 
Uh, we only got a 2% yield, and even that kept going on, putting another ring on. And so the other possibility we thought of is if we, we were trying to generate this kind of system from the indolone, if we could develop something like this, where we have a nucleophilic site on the indole, we have an indole joined to an indolone. If we had that, then maybe these two would dimerize to give this structure. Well, we didn't have that structure, but many years later, uh, Rui Chen discovered, I tell you quite honestly, by accident, completely by accident, he wasn't trying to make this. And so the important thing with all of science is to keep your eyes open for things you don't expect. Suddenly we had a way of making this structure where two indoles are directly linked. And it was a reasonable uh, yield. The key reagent was static chloride. And these can be formulated at the <coughs> C2 here and the C7 here. And so that raised the possibility, again, of making a beautiful structure. That's just a crystal structure of that. And one of the interesting things in that is that in the crystal, two of these uh, fit together quite neatly with some very uh, strong hydrogen bonding. And that became something that we would uh, find increasingly important. So we thought we should be able to take this compound and oxidize this indole to the indolone. Uh, that failed, despite the fact that we knew that we could do that in simple cases. If you take a simple indole, you can do that oxidation to the indolone, and this one equally well in quite good yields to the indolone. But the one, the case we wanted to use, uh, didn't work. Well, we made this compound by uh, a direct oxidative coupling using static chloride. And these things also have been done in the past with ferric chloride. And so we thought we should be able to do this again, take the bi-indolyl system and put two of these together. Uh, but all we got from these reactions were polymeric materials and no cyclic structures. And so, finally, we found that uh, benzoquinone oxidation uh, worked. But what happened here was that we got a head-to-head -head, uh, dimer. So this reacted, C2 reacts with C2, C7 reacts with C7. This is not, not a bad structure, but it's not the beautiful symmetrical structure that we were looking for. Now what happened here is that we had a chlorophenyl group, and we thought if we modified that and made that a more uh, electron donating group, it might uh, make the reactivity of these two systems more equal, and we went to a tolerant system, and here we got both the head-to-tail isomer and the head-to-head -head isomer. Uh, slightly more of the head-to-tail isomer, which now is this beautiful structure that we have been looking for. And two months before we published uh, some Japanese chemists uh, here, uh, Shinakubo and his group made uh, the same structure, different substituents around the edge and by a completely different method uh, using uh, boronic acid coupling processes. And so it was, was Unfortunate in a way that we weren't the first to do this, but it was encouraging that there was some other strange group somewhere else in the world that thought this was a good idea and it was a good structure to make. And so they've done a little bit of chemistry on that. And 
The only other structure that is similar is one that's postulated, it's not actually proven. But in the polymers that make up new melanin, one of the uh, structures is proposed to be this one. Now again, the indoles are not uh, exactly indoles, there's further oxidation that's taking place, but it's something that is, is similar. Now, what do our structures look like? Here is the, uh, the one we were searching for. And all of these are crystal structures, different images. And so the first thing to notice is that although it looks as though there's a nice hole there, this structure is not flat. Uh, so all the, the peripheral groups have been removed from these. And so it's a, a dish-shaped structure uh, presumably because you've got hydrogen sticking out into the middle and that doesn't allow it to be completely flat. The same was done with Shinakubo structure that it's, it's slightly dish-shaped. But one of the interesting things is the hydrogen bonding that's been found. There are some hydrogen bonding where simple protons from alkyl groups can hydrogen bond in a pi mode face on to benzene rings. And here, the function of the strength of the hydrogen bond depends on the uh, electron density of the aromatic system. And so indoles are better at this kind of hydrogen bonding than benzene rings. And our dimethoxy indoles are even better still because they're strongly, more, more strongly electron donated. So here we have a methanol molecule, uh, this hydrogen bonding from the oxygen, so the two hydrogens here on the nitrogen. But there is this very significant pi bonding uh, to the face of the indole. And so you can see you've got a face here and a face here. You've got the capacity for hydrogen bonding and stabilizing uh, small molecules in this cavity. When it comes to the head-to-head -head isomer, this one, equally this is not flat, but the, the walls around the cavity are actually steeper. And here again, we notice this very strong hydrogen bonding, uh, high bonding with the indole rings as well. This is the same kind of system and some more structures. We have various crystals uh, and in some of these you can again see the pi bonding into the walls of these cavities. Curiously this one uh, was crystallized from ether and there is the structure, this structure showing the cavity. Inside the cavity is a water molecule and this on top is an ether molecule. So, and they are attracted by hydrogen bonding. And we all know that ether and water don't mix, but if you keep a, a structure, a uh, specific crystalline structure, it just happens to suit for the water to be there and the ether to be there. So, I mentioned earlier that I think you can formulate this basic by indolar structure and we can of course reduce these to the benzoic alcohols as well. And given that we have found that these are very reactive to our activated indoles, we thought we would modify our initial aim of making a beautiful, rigid, flat structure and go back to making something that looks a bit more like the calyx structures where there are carbons joining the aromatic rings. And using that, you can do it. So you can take the biendolar system and the doubly benzoic alcohol, put these together with acid catalysis, and this goes in a head to tail format, the only structure we get is this one, where we have the four indoles, 
put together, but in this case, we have two direct links and we have two carbon links. So this is what we call a semi-calyx indole because it's a bit like a, a calyx indole and it's a bit like a endorphin. If you get that structure, uh, again, here are crystal structures. Uh, it's folded quite heavily. This even gives a steeper uh, pair of walls into the cavity than we've seen in the other cases. Very extensive hydrogen bonding. Uh, here we have some acetone molecules that are hydrogen bonded. And the methyl groups of the acetone tie hydrogen bonded into the walls of this cleft. And so that in many ways is a more interesting structure than the one we set out initially to make. You can follow this theme. It's the chemistry is the same, so it's just variations on the same kind of theme where if you take this doubly benzoic alcohol from a single indole, you can combine that with two indoles, one group protected by the aldehyde. And so you can put those two together. There you have a dialdehyde. You can reduce to the dialcohol. And a formaldehyde extrusion reaction closes this off to give calyx three indoles. If you do uh, This is now a similar case where we decided we, we wanted to find out how general this reaction could be. We've seen the reaction with the aldehyde, but this chemistry works very well whether you have an aldehyde here or a ketoester or a ketone uh, of various kinds. It's, it's a very general reaction, and so you can build up these structures which can then be taken on to give more complicated structures. So how general can we make this? Uh, we obviously need good nucleophilic indoles to combine with the benzoic cations. Indole itself doesn't react. It's not nucleophilic enough. If you put a methyl group on the nitrogen, this is a, a more powerfully nucleophilic structure, and so you can do that reaction quite well. And so if you build a diethyl system that's functionalized through nitrogen, through uh, not just a methyl oh, group, but benzyl like group, like you can build this strange 17-membered macrocyclic ring in very, very high yield. And so you have carbon links in all of these. And this is a, a sort of hybrid glycerin and, uh, Calyx indole, so three indoles, but one benzene ring. Uh, and the benzene is this meta substituted one. And again, it tells us that there is some benefit in having a combination between rigid structures and flexible structures, because this works extremely well. Again, how general can we make this? Clearly, you can put two indoles together through nitrogen. Uh, you have the indole aldehyde, you can reduce to the alcohol. And so we've made these where we have CH2 group or benzyl groups, both the, well, the ortho dibenzyl, meta dibenzyl and para dibenzyl. And all of these reactions go in very high yield to give what can be the basis of further chemistry because we have two aldehydes here. So in this way, how much time do I have? Five, okay. I'll just uh, quickly mention another theme that we have a range of these double aldehydes. And one of the things you can do with aldehydes is to make imines. And so I haven't told you how we make that, but this dialdehyde simply comes from the dimethoxy indole itself. So here we have a monoindole 
two aldehydes, monoethyl two aldehydes in different positions, diethyl two aldehydes, triethyl two aldehydes, triethyl two aldehydes, and these are different. Here the join is between C2 and C2, C7 and C2, here C2 and C7, C7 and C7. And so, given this message about flexibility, combination of rigidity and flexibility, we wondered if it would be possible to take unusual macrocyclic structures from these systems in the form of imines by reacting them with amines. So if you take this first one uh, with something like ethylene diamine, a simple one, you can get dimeric structures, but you get a, a mixture of compounds that's not very nice. If you go to uh, C6 diamine, you just get a complete mixture. Again, not very nice. If you go to a longer diamine, 10 carbons between the amino groups or 12 carbons between the amino groups, you get this very unusual macrocyclic structure. And the yields of these are, again, greater than 90%. They're far higher than you would ever predict that they would be. If you go to the other dialdehyde, now C2 and C7, with ethylene diamine, you get a dimerization, a uh, good macrocyclic system in reasonable yield, uh, and you only get one of them. And in this case, if you go to an extended uh, diamine with six carbons, you get a high yield of a 14 membered ring system. With 10 carbons, the yield drops uh, to 40 and 12 carbons, it's a moderate sort of 60 odd. If you build this system, the dialdehyde here, you can make uh, from the diamine, the simple ethylene diamine, you can make very uh, effective uh, structures of this kind. And here we have a chiral system giving that and an aromatic system. And these form many metal complexes. Uh, that's the crystal structure of the, uh, the, the one without the metal complex, the system. And if you come now to what we've learned from the activated dimethoxy in dolls, you can apply some of what we've learned to simple indoles that don't have this special application. So if you take indole itself, a doubly benzylic uh, bromide, you can build that kind of system, which we've seen earlier. And we can now formulate or put carbonyl groups at the C3 positions and build another imine system. So here we have uh, a dialdehyde with two indoles and a benzene ring. And again, really very good yields of quite complicated structures, a 70 membered ring in that case. And that's the uh, structure that we have. If you change, I've shown you the good examples. It doesn't always uh, give us good results. If you take this system, make the aldehydes there, uh, all you get from that is polymeric mixture. But if you go to bigger aldehydes, and in different cases here, different structures around the ring, different substituents, here again, this kind of dialdehyde will put together rather large rings in very, very good yield. Uh, the yield drops a bit as you play around. But in some of these, you've got flexible chains and rigid rings. And this seems to help in forming these large structures. And here again, if you take in this case, this dialdehyde, 
produce, uh, sorry, in this case you don't produce stuff react with ethylene diamine, you get again a very large ring. We don't have structures, crystal structures yet for that. And finally, if you take uh, a range of these structures that we saw earlier and combine them with various uh, diamines, again, they don't all give you good outcomes, but the outcomes that are good, for example, here, a 23 member ring system, uh, this 30 member ring system, things that you would think would be quite difficult to get a form in quite good yield, and we have uh, more of these, 31 member ring, uh, 30 big ring here, 32. Again, forming in good yield uh, and quite easily. And so these will form the basis of further work. We have uh, investigated the properties of these larger rings, the crystal structures, their capacity to uh, attract and retain small molecules. But just in finishing in summary, we've seen through making some new synthetic indoles, simple compounds but never been made before, deliberately to increase their reactivity. This expands the chemical and structural scope of indole chemistry. We are able to make our natural synthetic structures which are related, they take some of their uh, initial interest from natural products, but these are different from the natural ones, so they will have different properties and unpredictable properties. Another message is that the indoles can be employed as a design unit to substitute for phenol. So phenol chemistry is, is extensive, particularly in natural product structures, and so there's an element that can be developed here in terms of replacing phenols to make quite new structures. And the final message is that molecular, molecular activation enhances the existing reactivity and leads to the discovery of new chemistry. So if you want to try a new reaction and see if it's going to work, mostly we will take simple compounds but it's sometimes a good idea to take specially activated compounds and then you'll find that things do indeed work effectively. Well, many people have been involved in this work. In fact, a lot of it, uh, it's a bit of a retrospective. Uh, my great friend and colleague, Naresh Kumar, now professor, uh, actually did with his own fair hands some of the early chemistry we saw and the other people who have done uh, most of it that I've talked about here. And here is the wonderful Indonesian contingent that we have had. Uh, I haven't actually talked about their work today. Van Bang did uh, similar chemistry in our chemistry and in fact I talked about uh, the macrocycles that make complexes done by Scholihin and I should have put Ika, Ika Hidayat is uh, another one. She actually worked with Roger Reed, uh, but I was a co-supervisor of her work, which involved indoles, but was a, a different, uh, it was an approach to synthesize indole rather than to investigate the chemistry. The crystal structures were done by Mohan and Don Craig, and uh, we had some support from the research council. So I'm grateful to all these people and the entire group I've had over a very long time, and especially to my wonderful Indonesian uh, chemists. And we have more of them in our group. Thank you. For the discussion, please raise your hands and um, I have one. Yes, okay, Thomas. Uh, Dr. Craig, you want to go? Great reason, Dr. Craig, very nice uh, lecture. I have a small question. I don't think I can answer that one.
storing storing I just wonder uh, what you have in your mind uh, to be made or to have an analog of based on your uh, in the compound dari sini jalan from chemical point of view or maybe from biology point of view yes Well, they have been, they have been, uh, yeah, uh, in so Asia, uh, but not the, perhaps I wouldn't be surprised if some of these things didn't go up in Asia, but uh, the crucial thing for us is that the Foxy substitution pattern, and while we've seen that you can get the Foxy groups, you can get the Foxy groups, in some of the, the serotonin and melatonin uh, chemistry, for example, when they turn up in, in nature frequently, they're not always in exactly the same positions. Uh, there's clearly a lot more chemistry that could be done in the calyx 3 and calyx 4 in doll chemistry. Uh, we tried to do some of this some years ago, and it's actually very complicated because of the range of possibilities The structural variation, whether you get uh, cone, flat, partial cone, uh, completely, a bit like the calyxerine chemistry, where you can get a range of different conformational systems. And we we began to look at this, and uh, if you take the calyx three adults, for example, with a, a substituent on each of the linking carbs. There are many, many different conformational isomers that you can get. And it was really very, very complicated. And I'm afraid we, we gave up uh, on, on that area. But it's something that we could put a lot of effort into and I think get a lot of benefit out of. But we didn't have the, uh, the capacity and human resources to, to commit to a major investigation at that time. But the four, the calyx fours, again, uh, there are four different versions and we haven't really thoroughly investigated any of those. And each one of those would be worth a major investigation. But again, you need lots of uh, skilled people. Not easy chemistry. Yes. Okay, 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 yeah. Synthetic one, so we didn't find it in nature. Any questions? Any Organic synthetic. Okay. Please mention your chapter name and your institution. Thank you, Dr. Black. I'm from Microsense, here in Indonesia. The main problem of organic synthesis is how to separate this product and how to elucidate the sector. What is the, you can make adjustment for separation and identification of the product? I guess the inspiration is, is heavily artistic actually. It, it's you know, designed beautiful structures uh, and also the link with natural products. Uh, all of the uh, indoor compounds, huge range of them uh, in nature, which is so important. Uh, and so that if you pick up any organic chemistry journal, you will find indoor chemistry still being worked on. It's a very uh, fruitful area because of the reactivity of the indoor system. So that's one point is the natural products background that, that leads you to try and do something Uh, it is like nature, but is a bit different. Uh, for example, a lot of organic, or well, not a lot, but some organic chemists like to synthesize natural products, total synthesis of natural products. And it's very, very difficult that they have to know a lot more chemistry than I know. They are far cleverer than I am because they can manipulate lots of known reactions and the the better of them can invent new reactions and they can succeed in making highly complicated molecules. We 
which is a demonstration of their brilliance. But at the end, they made a compound that's already known. And I would rather make compounds that are not known, and which are easy to make, of course, uh, because you can compromise. Because when you make something that is not known, you have this curiosity. What, what sort of properties will this compound have? And often you can predict, you can say, oh, well, it'll just be like such and such. But every now and then you get something that surprises you. And then you move on to something different. Uh, so the, the Calix 3 indoles, for example, came out of a minor product. And the discovery of that, we were doing something, something else. We got a minor 15% yield of this minor product. And the researcher was so good, identified there's this other stuff there, what is it? Isolated it, and it turned out to be that, and on we went. It, it generated a completely new project. Then the, the other aspect is, uh, well, the artistic aspect is to design and see if you can make a beautiful structure like the porphyrin or a similar system. So organic chemistry has a strongly artistic element in, in this kind of work. I don't know whether that clarifies what you wanted to know or not. I think the uh, question is how to separate because that's a usually a the, the separate the compounds. Compounds. Chromatography. Yes. In, in most cases, chromatography. I have to say yeah. the. And also the elucidation. Well, then that's the spectroscopic. Yeah. Spectroscopic NMR spectroscopy is, is critical. And that's another interesting point because the, uh, we put the methoxy groups on the indole for reasons of activation. But they also very, very greatly simplify the NMR spectra. And so you can see what's going on. You can see if you put several of these indoles together in the same molecule, or if you've just got one, or if the several are exactly the same. And so you get a clarity in the NMR spectra that you don't get if you just had indole itself. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing that is, I think, quite important, the work I talked about at the end, the imine formation, those really big, ugly looking rings, most of those, the product crystallizes out of solution. No chromatography. And uh, the, the key thing is that we were doing, I mean, normally when you make an imine, you would use ethanol. Amine and aldehyde together in ethanol. And Kidia Sompol, who did this, uh, found that everything was too soluble in ethanol. And so you've got to go into complicated workup to get the product out. By going to isopropanol, the compounds were just that bit less soluble and that just crystallized out of solution. So it was a matter of filtering off, washing, sometimes recrystallizing, but they came out very, very cleanly in high yield, which, uh, which surprised us. So if you can get away without chromatography, that's wonderful. But I guess 90% of an organic chemist's time is spent doing chromatography which is one of the more tedious things, I guess. Okay. Okay. I think that's enough. Okay, thanks a lot for your really nice presentation. So please